Let's sing today. All right, sing with me. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. Yeah. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Yeah. Let's come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started, yeah. Yes, our God, we'll finish what he started, oh. This is my testimony from death to life. His grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I'm not dead and you're not done Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead then you're not done no. Greater things are still to come Oh, I believe If I'm not dead then you're not done The greater things are still to come Oh, I Still to come, oh, I believe. Yeah, this is my testimony. This is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Now I'm. This is my testimony from dead to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Bridgepoint, happy Sunday. How are we doing? We good? Some energy in the room. I want to welcome you for joining us online or here with us at our Tyrone campus. My name is Travis James. I'm the campus pastor here, and we are glad that you have joined us for Fan Day. If you're online, and that's the reason I'm wearing a jersey, if you're here on site, you saw all of the fan gear, all of the flags repping all the teams, and that's why many of the folks in here are repping your team. To the guests, this is an opportunity on Fan Day to invite our friends, family, associates, and neighbors to join us to see what God is doing in and through Bridgepoint. So whether you've been in church before or this is your first time walking in any church doors, welcome. Glad you're here. 
want you to feel especially welcome in this place today. But before we get going, let me ask you, what, what teams are we repping? Who are the Gators fans? Yes, sir. Not many. Not many. How about the Knowles? My wife is a Knoll. I got I to gotta root them on. Some, some Lightning fans? Some Rays fans, Rowdies, and all the Tampa Bay. That's it. So listen, I, I'm from Atlanta. I'm a Braves fan. I'm a Georgia Bulldog fan. And I grew up a Duke basketball fan. Tyler, who's one of the pastors here, he's going to come out. He's giving the message. We got a great message today. He's in an Auburn Tigers jersey. And he thanked me before uh, the earlier service. Thank, he thanked me for not wearing a Georgia Bulldogs jersey. And I told him I wouldn't do that to him, even though Georgia beat them yesterday, 42 to 10. Did y'all hear that? Some of y'all were talking. It was 42 to 10. That's a stomping. And I I wasn't going to do that. I did wear some socks, though, some Georgia Bulldogs socks. I'm also repping uh, Duke. I can't show you. I'm not going to show you my underwear, but I've got all the teams rep today. But listen, listen, whether your team lost a, a fat L yesterday by 32 points, Auburn Tigers, or if you won, whether it's a win or a loss, you're welcome here. And even in life, if it's a win or if it's a loss, you're welcome in this place. Regardless of what your past has been like, regardless of what your present might look like, and regardless of what tomorrow might bring, we are here gathered as a community to to enter into this time of worship, worshiping a God who is good, a God who is faithful, a God who is trustworthy, and a God who loves us regardless. Amen? So in this time, especially if it's your first time, just sit back and maybe we set aside the distractions that life can bring. We set aside the distractions of what today might have in store. And we open up ourselves to the possibility that we're not here by accident. We're not here just because of an invitation, even though that goes a long way. But we're here because there's been a stirring inside us, a God drawing us near, because God has a message for us as a community and a message for us individually today. Amen? Let's worship.
not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I'm chosen, I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am chosen
won't fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. No, no, he won't. Yeah, come on. Yeah, amen to that. Would you guys pray with me? So God, that is, um, and that's just what we are declaring today, God. We praise you, Lord, for the fact that you don't fail, you haven't yet, and you won't still, and you never will, God. And we just are thankful today, Lord, that we can trust you, that we can find hope in you, God, that we can uh, find love in you, Lord, because you love us so much, God. We thank you for Jesus that... Because you loved us so much, you sent your son to die on a cross for us and that it didn't just end there, that he rose from the grave, God, to be our Lord and Savior, to take our struggles, our burdens where we've missed the mark, Lord. And we are uh, just declaring uh, thankfulness and praise today because of that, God. We thank you that um, you've given us life, that you've taken us from death to life, Lord, and that we are yours, that we are seen, we're known, we're loved by you, God, and um, we celebrate that today, Lord, and I just pray that you remind each and every person in this room, each and every person that can hear my voice, that no matter where we are in this um, in this journey with you, God, whether uh, we have a personal relationship with you, maybe we don't, Lord, um, no matter where we are in that, that you make your presence known today, God, that you... Um, reveal yourself to us maybe in a new way that we haven't experienced before, Lord. And uh, we are here for you. We're here to um, take a step closer to you, God. And so help us do that today. Help us lean into what you have for us. And yeah, we thank you for this time. We love you so much. It's your name that I pray. Amen. Awesome, y'all. Thank you for singing with us. You can have a seat. times today I will cross over a threshold. I hope I will catch a few of those times. I need to remember that my life is, in fact, a continuous series of thresholds. From one moment to the next. From one thought to the next. From one action to the next. Help me appreciate how awesome this is. How many are the chances to really be alive? Help me cross into the present moment into the wonder, into your grace, the now place where we all are unfolding moment by moment. All right, it's fan day, Bridgepoint. How we feeling? You doing okay? Yes. Man, fan day, so good. I am repping my Auburn jersey still because apparently I don't know how to walk away from things that hurt me, but that's a different message for another day. Fan day is a great reminder for some of you that when you walk in and it's like, you know, it's something about them. And then we see who you pull for and it's like, yeah, I knew I didn't like them. I I could tell, like I knew knew it. And so it's just, it levels the playing field. We just get it all out there and and see who everybody is is rooting for. I love these days and these types of experiences. Not just do we get to show up with some energy in church, but also, and I know you're gonna wanna celebrate this and get excited about it. This is a special day in the life of our church because at our downtown campus and Seminole campus, it is day one for their brand new campus pastors on site in the house. Can we get excited? Yes. 
And it's a really cool opportunity to come and just see all that God is doing in and through Bridgepoint. So if it is your first time at Bridgepoint, I want to echo what I hope you've heard. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So everybody in the room and online on a campus, make sure you stop by an info table, welcome tent on the way out. We have a little guest bag just to say thank you for coming and seeing what God's doing here. It's a really, really special time. We're starting a brand new series today. We're going to walk through the biblical book of Galatians. If you have ever read the Bible or specifically the book of Galatians and thought, what am I reading? You are in the right place. Uh, we're going to walk through this book kind of chapter at a time, unpacking Galatians. And we're calling this series Grace the Now Place. I think what you'll discover as we walk through Galatians is it's a book that's all about grace. Grace being that deep breath of the soul where the weight is lifted, the shame is gone, and you can just... B. And that's a space that's for right here, right now. It's a grace that covers the weight, the shame, the brokenness of the past. It's a grace that will be enough for the future, but grace is the now place to be able to live our lives in freedom the way God intended. So towards that end, I want to jump in and set up the book of Galatians a little bit, all right? Paul wrote the book of Galatians. It wasn't like somebody didn't sit down and say, hey, let's start a new religion, and they write the Bible. Instead, the Bible is actually a collection of letters or uh, historical recordings or people that were referencing uh, the, the move of God throughout humanity. <clears throat> Excuse me, Galatians was one of those. Paul wrote it. Uh, if you know Paul's story, I wish we had time to unpack that wild, wild encounter with Jesus that totally changed Paul's life. We'll talk about that a little bit. He wrote it to churches that were gathering in a region of Galatia. This would have been like Middle East or West Asia, present day. But they, it were people back then, it wasn't like a manual on how to do church. So Paul was writing this letter to say, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus well, to inspire these churches to do that. He wanted them to, to know the grace of Jesus. Now, let me give the context in what he was writing. Uh, in, in, in this moment, when Paul penned this letter, Jesus had already come and lived his life. Jesus had already died his death on the cross and they had already placed Jesus' dead body in the tomb, all right? He was a dead man. It's a historically recorded event. You can look back through history and look back at this time. What's wild about it and a little bit different than normal is that three days after his dead body was placed in the tomb, he rose and left the tomb walking as a living, breathing person yet again. The power of God at work through Jesus that you and I might know the grace of God. And what's even wilder about it is it's not a made up story because there were actually eyewitnesses to Jesus being alive after he had died. People had breakfast with him on the beach. That sounds nice. It's a real thing. They interacted with him. They shared meals with him. It, we're talking about hundreds of people that saw a once dead man live pretty impressive. There was also a group of people that saw this same Jesus ascend back to heaven, which I'm sure was as trippy of a moment as they get. But this was real historically recorded stuff with real eyewitnesses. So the Galatians weren't sitting like we are trying to decide, was the death and resurrection, did, did that actually happen or is that a story? Like some of them may have actually seen it or they knew somebody that had seen it. So what, what they were processing was what does this mean? <laughs> what, what does this mean? Because this changes everything. The, the guy that went around saying that he was God ended up proving it in the wildest of ways. And then Paul writes it and says, keep living out your faith. It matters. So let me, let me let you hear from Paul, the historical figure, less my perspective, more Paul's today as we read Galatians chapter one. If you have Bibles, you can turn there. If you have a Bible app, you can join me there. I'll put it on the screen. Here's what this means. We're in the book of Galatians chapter one. That's what that means. Starting in verse one. ESV is the translation, since for English Standard Version. The Bible wasn't originally written in English, it's just translated into it. So I'll actually be in the ESV for most of today's talk, except for a moment when I jump to the MSG, which is the message. But anyway, that's what all that means. If ever you've thought, what, what does all that even mean? This is just talking, we're reading Paul's letter in Galatians, starting at the very beginning in the English Standard Version. Paul wrote this, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, all right? In other words, Paul's coming in hot. 
He's not saying, hey, I don't want to write you guys a feel-good message. This isn't a letter to just say, hey, how you doing? What you been up to? This is like, hey, I need to talk about some stuff. And this is God stuff, not preference stuff. This is an opinion stuff. This is what an almighty God who is alive and well at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now, he wants you to know this. So for present day purposes, can we pause for just a minute in recognizing that Paul's going straight in saying, you guys remember, you know people that saw it. Maybe you saw it yourself. You guys know that God the Father raised Jesus, his son from the dead. Listen up for just a second. But here's what I know about a moment like this. And here's what I think is so cool about how God's working at Bridgepoint. Some of you are coming in believing that and have believed that Jesus died, rose, and and lives right now longer than some of us have been alive. And I love that. I love that. Some of you are coming in saying, I'm trying to figure this faith thing out. I'm sort of new to it. I'm excited to be here. Cool that we're in fan gear, whatever, whatever, whatever. Some of you are coming and you're like, I'm here because I heard there was food afterwards and I could wear a jersey. But I have questions about faith. And when you talk about dead people coming back to life, like that's a bit much for me. And it is for me too, had it not been historically recorded as real. But, But for all of us, for all of us, could, could we start today just from a perspective of, of just the potential, like, like, like just the what if questions. What if Paul's moment that in, in this letter, he intended to be a God moment. What if this could be a God moment for you and I as well? That whether you're all in on this stuff today or you, you have tons of questions, or you find yourself just somewhere in the middle. What if we leaned in together today to the possibility, the possibility, right? What what does it hurt that it's possible? That there is a God that is alive and by his spirit is present right here, right now. Because I know for a fact, some of you walked in feeling great about your week. Your team won, you had a great week, things are good. I know for a fact, some of you walked in and you're at a tough, tough moment, not just because your team lost or got beat by a better team, but because life feels like a loss right now. What if this could be our God moment? And let me ask it to you this way, just just to lean in together towards that end. And let me start here for you personally. How would you answer this? What if the death and resurrection of Jesus is real? What if the death and resurrection of Jesus is is real. Now, I'll show you my cards. I believe that it, he, it, it is. That's why I stand up here and tell people about it every single week, that I've, I've heard enough, I've believed enough, I've encountered Jesus enough on my own to believe that it is real. I would love for you to lean in today just saying the possibility that if there is a God, what if, what if how I answer this question matters and could matter and make for a special moment here today? That's where you lean in. Some of you that have been following Jesus for a while, you're sold on the the answer to this question. You would say, absolutely, it's real. It's changing my life. To which I would say, great, I love that. But I want you to lean in today because I, I think how you answer this question still matters. What if the death and resurrection is real? And the reason I ask it that way is because I think there are some of us that through lip service say, yes, it is. But the way we're living our life suggests otherwise. What if the death and resurrection of Jesus is real? That, that wasn't the question the Galatians were wrestling with. They knew that it was. The Roman Empire knew that it was. They had a dead man and they placed guards to guard his dead body to make sure no silly business happened. And then turns out that the dead man rose from the grave anyway. The Roman authorities, the rulers of the time, the people of this day and age, they weren't asking this question. They had to ask, is Jesus' death and resurrection enough? Is it enough for the rescue of the human heart, just like he promised? So wherever you find yourself today, could I just invite you today? This isn't like a lean back, cross out, let's get to the burgers and dogs, but, but what if just collectively on every campus and online, we just said, what if? What if? What if it is real and what would it mean? I think if, if, we'll, if we'll process that, Today might be absolutely special in your faith journey and mine. 
Don't take it from my words. Let's go back to Paul. Galatians chapter one, verses three through five, Paul's writing and he says this, grace to you, that's a strong start, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. That is a strong start. Here's what I mean. If on your way in today, when you stopped and got your cup of Starbucks or you picked it up at the info or the Point Cafe on your campus or online, wherever you were, if you said, hey, good morning, and somebody said, good morning, grace and peace to you in the name of the Father who sent his son and rose him from the grave to free all of humanity and to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. You would be like, chill out. Like less caffeine, too much, too soon. I'm not there yet. But you see what Paul's doing? He's wasting no time. I mean, he starts the letter of the Galatians saying, hey, this is God's stuff, not man's stuff. And we wanna talk about God's stuff. Then you need to know that grace to you and peace from God is available. Hey, if Paul was standing right here, do you know what he would wanna say? Grace and peace is available to you from God. Let's not waste our time playing or pretending. Let's not waste our time missing the magnitude of the moment that Paul jumps straight into this moment saying, grace and peace to you. It comes through Jesus who literally gave himself. Remember, he's writing to people that knew it. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Why? Because God the Father wanted that, and that's why Paul's saying he deserves all the glory forever and ever, amen. And I wonder, I wonder when we look at your life or mine and the culture around us, our neighbors or friends and what we see in the news and on social media, I wonder how many of us are living life in grace with peace, Right? I mean, just think about the past couple years in your journey. Was it very graceful and peaceful? Where are you from? (laughs) I wonder, I wonder if the reason we see so few people living so gracefully and so peacefully is not because all of us don't desire that. Who wouldn't want that deep breath in the soul where the weight could be lifted and the condemnation and shame is gone? But I wonder if we don't find it because there's far too many of us that are searching for that in places that were never intended to provide it for us. Grace to you and peace from God. What if that's the peace that we're missing? And I want you to know, like, Paul's not writing to to drum up this nice, like, feel-good religiosity letter. Paul's saying, guys, when you've encountered Jesus, it changes everything. it's It's a grace that's enough in spite of life's circumstances and allows you to live with a peace in the midst of a very otherwise unpeaceful world. But Paul's saying, guys, remember, That only comes from Jesus because if you and I could have found it on our own, wouldn't we have already done that? I love the thought. Paul's writing from his experience that he had an encounter with the grace of peace, grace and peace of God that changed it all. Paul continues by saying this. It gets a little harsh here because he's he's frustrated. Look what he says. I'm astonished that you, and maybe this would apply to us, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Gospel was the word that they used. It, it's kind of translated as like good news, but it's, it's the story that Jesus died and rose. He died a sinner's death and rose to redeem, restore, and repair the broken, sinful hearts of man. So the, that gospel word, he's saying, you guys... You're turning from what Jesus has offered you to a different gospel. Side note, Paul says, not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. You see, Paul was writing into a church that wasn't questioning if Jesus had died and rose. He was writing into a group of people that were trying to decide, is that enough? 
Because what was happening is that the churches in the time, there were people that were showing up saying, yeah, Jesus is good. Yeah, you should follow Jesus. And if you'll follow Jesus and fill in the blank, then you'll experience what Jesus intended. If you'll follow Jesus and give enough or clean your mouth up enough or, or attend enough right Bible studies, if you'll follow Jesus and fill in the blank, then you'll experience all of Jesus. As Paul was saying, I'm astonished. I'm astonished that any of you would try to add anything to what Jesus has done because the moment you try to add anything to the sacrificial, complete work of Jesus's death and resurrection is the moment you begin to water down the whole thing. Because if you and I could find grace and peace on our own, we wouldn't need Jesus. But isn't that the reality we live in that we do? We need grace and peace. And Paul's saying it's in God. Turn to Jesus and don't try to add a bunch of hoops to it. Paul was combating legalism of the day. That's what he was talking about. Legalism is a very churchy word. And basically, if I could try to break it down for all of us, legalism expresses itself in three different ways that Paul was writing about. But I think it's three different ways that it's actually gonna sound quite common in our culture today, whether somebody's expressing it in church or not. Legalism is that attempt to please God or people by working in our own power. Here's, here's what that tends to look like. I'm good. <laughs> Do you need any help? No, I got it. I'm fine. I've got this. I'll handle my business. I'll take care of my stuff. I'm okay, I can do that. I'll pull myself up by the bootstraps. When things go wrong, I'll toughen up, I'll strengthen up, I'll man up, I'll woman up. I'll do what I have to do because I'm good. You know anybody that's like that? Did you feel that elbow from the person sitting next to you? Legalism often expresses itself as, as attempts to please God or people by working in our own rules. Because sometimes that's easier to be like, well, hey, that might work for you, but I've got my truth. So good on you for your truth, but I've got my truth and I'm gonna do it my way, according to my time and my perspective with my experiences. And, and it, it's, it tends to be well-meaning, but it's almost like, I, I'm good, I've got this. I'm gonna play by these rules. So you worry about you and I'm gonna worry about me because your truth is, it works for you, my truth works for me. But the moment we try to begin to assign truth is the moment we've lost all reality of what truth really means at that point. Know anybody that plays by those rules? Legalism is often the attempts to please God or people by working in an effort to earn or deserve. I think this one's pretty common for us too because either trying to overcome a shameful, disappointing, embarrassing background or to prove in the moment that we are enough, life becomes about what I can point to of my successes as reason to show that I'm all right. I mean, you, you know what kind of job I have? You know what car I'm driving? You know how many likes I've got in social media? You know my influence? You know my story? Do you know who I hang out with? And you know where I work? I'm good, you should worry about you. It's all over the place. And, and Paul was saying, guys, I, I'm, I'm astonished. Because here's what's true about all of us. In Paul's day, it's true about every single one of us in this room today. We are all longing for something deep inside of us. The question is simply, where do you turn to try to satisfy that longing? Well, what do you turn to for comfort? Because what are we searching for? Every single human heart desires to be loved and desires to be accepted and desires to belong. And when we can't find that, oftentimes we'll take it upon ourselves to seek it out in a relationship. This person completes me. In substances, I'm not enough and these help me not to feel it in likes or statuses, look at my perfect social media life, in a job status, in a bank account or a savings fund, in a car or home or a second home, in who we hang out with and how we pride ourselves to be. Maybe for some of you, it's in the idea of comfort or security. The idea that, we, that I, because I'm in control, I can feel comfortable and safe. Maybe it's about your status, your perspective, or, or what others pe feel about you. It's in the fact that you are 
beautiful or that you can do it or that you can perform at an elite level. All of us, all of us are driving our lives to satisfy that inner goal to be loved, to be accepted, and to belong. And, and if we could handle that on our own, if that was achievable in and of our own strength, then, then we ought to be able to look at the people who have that stuff and think they've got it all together. That'd be celebrities, right? It'd be the rich. It'd be the successful. It'd be the, the influencers. It'd, it'd be the ones that have it all, at least on the outside, that we should point to. And those should be the people that we say, look how graceful, look how peaceful they are. But we know that's not true because that stuff doesn't help us feel loved, accepted, and like we belong. That's what Paul is getting at. Guys, you're turning to other things, things that aren't real and things that won't do it. You're distorting what is good about the good news of Jesus Christ, or some of us in our culture flat out deny it at all. But can I make kind of a tough point about that? When we work to distort or deny the gospel of Jesus, it does make it easier to disregard, but it does not make it untrue. When we work to distort it, that's not what he meant. That's not how I interpret it. I don't think that's what Jesus was aiming at. Or when we work to deny it, I don't believe that stuff. I think it's not real. None of those things make it untrue. It just makes it easier for us to live a life that's not based in what is true. You've played hide and seek with kids, right? You've done this with little ones. Hey, you wanna play hide and seek? Of course I do. Great, I'll count. You go hide. One, two, three. Are you hiding? Are you going yet? I got a five-year-old little girl a couple years ago. I remember these moments well. Counting all the way up to 10 and then I open my eyes and standing right in front of me this little girl that's doing this. <laughs> At which point I'm like, what's wrong with you, kid? What's your problem? How can you not figure this game out? I'm kidding. I didn't do that, all right? But what's, what's really, really cute about that at a childish age is to think that if I just close my eyes and distort my reality or dis deny what's really true, then the person trying to find me will never be able to see me. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm standing there staring at her looking like this. She thinks she's so hidden. And I'm looking at her like, you're so messed up. It's cute as a child. But guys, can I bring it forward a little bit? That, that to distort or deny the historical reality, the history redefining event of Jesus' death and resurrection is either intellectually lazy or spiritually apathetic. Because it, this is recorded history. Now, what we do with it certainly matters, but we can distort or deny all we want, but it doesn't make it untrue that Jesus died and rose from the dead, declaring himself God and savior of the broken human heart. Paul suggests it's worth exploring because for Paul, this wasn't just something that you should do. This was something that changed him. And he gets to that. Galatians chapter one, uh, verses 13 and 14, Paul says this. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently, like followers of Jesus. He was out to kill them and trying to destroy their movement. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Paul was like, you know my story. You know who I was. And you know that I had it all together by those standards. 
Now, Paul, Paul didn't, uh, he wasn't ashamed of his story. He actually shared it a lot as much as he wrote it in Galatians in this passage. I want to, he kind of puts a magnifying glass on it in another book that he wrote. We call it the, the book of Philippians. It's also in the Bible. Let me jump over to Philippians and share with you Paul's perspective on who he once was. Cause I think this is absolutely astounding. And I hope that this is an encouragement to you too. Paul said, you know, my pedigree. He's about to line it up and show it off. I, was, I had a legitimate birth. I was circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church. Paul was like, you know who I was. I was a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special. Look at this. Paul said, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Guys, don't don't miss this. Paul, Paul was elite. Paul was elite. We're not talking about a pretender. We're talking about a dude that literally had it together. He had status, influence, wealth, perspective, wisdom. In terms of faith, he knew the Bible frontwards and backwards, could quote it and lived it at least out on the outside. Paul had it all. He was hanging out with the right people. He was doing the right stuff. And on the outside, Paul was the type of guy that you and I would look to and say, man, I'd give anything to be like Paul to come from his family, to come in his upbringing, from his background, with everything that Paul was, he was elite. And Paul says, I'm willing to tear it up and throw it out with the trash. Why? What on earth would ever move a man that elite that had arrived and had it all together? Why would you ever throw that away? Why would you ever throw that privilege and perspective away? Why would you ever want to trade that in? And I want you to see exactly what Paul says. His words, not mine. Paul said, because of Christ, that's why. Because of Jesus. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything, Paul said, everything. I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. Paul, how do you really feel though? Could you, I feel like, you know, you're holding back. (laughs) Paul said every ounce of what made him elite, every status, every marker, every achievement, every ounce of influence, all the people that would flock to him and learn from him and listen to him, all the people that said, if I could be like Paul, if I could get near Paul, if I could, if I could track like Paul, all of that in Paul's mind was as worthwhile to him as dog dung. What, what does that to somebody? What does that to a man that's arrived? What changes somebody that's willing to say, this is so worthless. It's so empty. It's so meaningless. I equate it to something so common, so average, so yuck as dog dung. Paul said this, I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ Jesus, and look what he says, and be embraced by him. Guys, don't miss that. The status, the elite nature, everything that he was, everything that he had, all that made up Paul. Paul was saying, all of this, I'm willing to close the door and turn on so that I can grab a hold of Christ to embrace him and be figuratively embraced by him. And I need you all to hear me very clearly today. That if that could be true for a guy like Paul, that it could be true for somebody like you and me. That maybe the reason so many of us are lacking grace and peace in our journey 
is we're fighting to embrace everything but Jesus. And to reach a place where Jesus becomes so real and that as his spirit's working in a moment like this, so tangibly for some of you, that it's like, I'll turn in the addiction. I'll turn in the relationships. I'll turn in the stuff, the striving, the pursuit. I'll, I'll, I'll lay all of those things down that I've been searching for love, acceptance, and belonging in as long as I can grab a hold of Jesus and forever experience his love envelop me that allows me to live in grace and peace for the rest of my days. That's what Paul experienced. Let me jump you back to Galatians and and I'll, I'll let you hear it from Paul's words again. Paul said, but when he, that's God, when God had set me apart before I was born and he called me by his grace, when God was pleased to reveal his son to me in the next couple of verses, just described when, when I understood who Jesus was, Paul said, everything changed. Because suddenly having enough, being enough, earning enough, working hard enough, being strong enough, tough enough, sweet enough, pretty enough, comfortable enough, none of it was enough. But Jesus was. Guys, I I hope what Paul's letter is the reminder to you and to me today is this, that Jesus is the real hope that we might be fully known and fully loved. And from that place, have a peace and a grace that this world can't offer us. What, what would it mean for you if the, res, the death and resurrection of Jesus was real or enough? That you could peel off the pretending masks, that you could lay aside the exhaustion and the anxiety and the stress, that you could navigate a job that certainly doesn't, that suddenly doesn't have to define you in the same way, that it's not about the relationship status or lack thereof. It's not about feeling comfortable or not. It's not about having it all. It's not even about trying to earn and achieve the good life. It's suddenly a discovery of a relationship that is better than life in the person and work of Jesus. That by his spirit can be as present and real in this moment as he was to every Galatian that witnessed his life, death, and resurrection. But see, here's the beauty of the offer of grace from Jesus. It wasn't just for Paul's time. It was for all time. Paul writes out, uh, wraps up chapter one, and I wanna start wrapping up with this. Paul said, they, is talking about people, they only were hearing it said, he, they're talking about Paul, they were only hearing it said, Paul, who used to persecute us, is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me, Paul said. Because for Paul, this wasn't a religiosity to put on. This was a relationship that began to change him and free him from the inside out. To leave everything he once knew and had and thought important. And just hang on to the only thing that really ever was. And here's what I'm betting for a lot of you. I'm betting a lot of you have been caught in that rat race journey, working really hard, trying to earn it or prove it, or just trying to keep going because of the shame and the condemnation of the past and the brokenness, all the while recognizing that we are imperfect people, but you probably didn't need need me to tell you that, did you? Recognizing that we live in a broken, hurting world and this life is stressful and it's anxious and it's hard and it's confusing and yet at the middle of that has always intended to be because of the love of God and his heart for you and for me, grace in the now place. That to just pause and check all of those efforts and all of those strivings and all of those identities and pursuits and the willingness to lay them down in recognition that they'll never be enough to grab a hold of forever the grace of God that will satisfy you and I in a way that nothing in this life ever has or ever could. Grace is the now place and grace is for you. Can I tell you specifically what I mean? 
Have you guys ever heard of a man named Tom Brady? <laughs> Full disclosure, and if you've been around Bridgepoint a while, you know this. I could not stand him as a patriot. I couldn't stand him. I couldn't. And I've stated it publicly. It's, 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 this is not new news. But here's the reality, and I've confessed this to Tom. I was wrong. It was me, not you. It was me. Because what I discovered is that when Tom moved into the neighborhood, figuratively speaking, and suddenly those TDs became TDs for the bucks, and his wisdom and his goatness and his brilliance became part of a buccaneer thing, I realized that he's actually not so bad. <laughs> I just needed to give him a chance. And Tom, that's me, man. That's me. It's on me. It's not you. And if I could leave you with one thing today, it has nothing to do with Tom Brady, so don't panic. Today's invitation for every single heart engaging with this message is to take one step towards believing. What if Jesus' death and resurrection was real and it's enough that I need to spend myself getting to know him since he moved into my neighborhood figuratively? What if it's enough to believe that what I'd heard about God isn't what's true about him? What if it's enough to, to take a step of faith saying, nothing I've tried before has worked, why not give him a chance? What if it's enough for our lives to say, I'm too broken and imperfect on my own and I can't redeem my sinful heart? But what if it's true that he has? And today's invitation is to take one step towards the faith that doesn't suddenly give you all the answers or make life perfect, but instead begins a journey of discovering something that's better than life. The love of Jesus that provides the grace for our souls that allows us to live at peace in a very broken, hurting world. That's grace in the now place. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Could I give you something just to process with me? Some of you today, I, I know some of the stories that you've walked in just carrying the weight of the world. You've been trying to earn it. You've been trying to prove it. You've been trying to show that you are enough or you can be enough or you can do enough. You can fix the relationship, you can make enough, you can, you can handle this on your own. But how many of us, if we're gut level honest with ourselves, that we've ever been able to be enough for us? But see, you don't need, you don't need me to tell you how, much, how hurting we are. That's what we all have in common. We're sinful, broken people in need of help and in need of a rescue that's bigger than ourselves. What if today, what if Paul's words were enough for us to lean in to the possibility that Jesus really did die and he really did rise? What if it's enough to take a step towards believing that he could be enough for us in all the ways that we never will be? And today it's just about the decision to step towards that, to ask for help, to trust God, to go to him with your hurts, with your brokenness and with your sin, to acknowledge our imperfections before a holy, good and loving God and to believe that his death and resurrection is enough that we might be able to live the life we never thought possible. That's what today's is about, is the invitation to know and feel the figurative embrace of a God who deeply loves you, always has, and always will. Let's pray to him together. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for Paul's words that remind us, that remind us that we're, we're not perfect people. And yet your heart towards us was not to break us, condemn us, or shame us, but instead to love us that you might embrace us that by turning from our sin and brokenness, believing in your death and resurrection and growing into a greater belief, 
is the beginning towards discovering a God that can satisfy our soul's every longing. That by you, God, we are fully loved, fully known, fully accepted, and we fully belong in the family of God. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that it's possible for every heart today and forever to know your love. We pray that it might be true in this space and with hearts tuning in today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, this, this, is, this is a big moment. I told you to lean into it. It's a possibility. What, what if what if this moment is, is for you as much as it's for me? That with everything you've been carrying, with all the weight, with all the sin, with all the struggle, and with all the strife, this is the reminder that none of that ever has the capacity to be enough to define all of you and all of me. That Jesus' posture towards you is love. It's just a matter of like Paul did with all of his elite checkbox characteristics. He turned to embrace Jesus and be embraced by him. We have a space called prayer and care. And if you're carrying weight, if you're stuck, if you're striving, if you're unsatisfied and longing, our prayer and care team today would love to introduce you towards a journey with Jesus to discover that he is enough for you. You go out those doors or balcony out the doors and to the right to our team. They would love to pray with you online. You simply click a link and we would love to engage and pray with you there. But just because we want to deny it or distort it doesn't mean it's not real. So for those of you that have been following Jesus for a little while, can I ask you, maybe you answered yes, that it is real. But are you living your life fully satisfied? Or is there still parts of your heart or parts of your life or parts of your ego that you're fighting for? Drop it today to be embraced by him. Whatever it looks like, Let's cap today by singing and celebrating the reminder of the depths of his love for us as we stand and do business with God together.
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Come on, sing it out. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. That's right, come on. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb. day huh hey I just uh, I feel led to to remind you we've been we've been talking about it but we've just been singing about it God loves you yeah even you God loves you there's not a single thing that you could say or do to make God love you any more any less than God loves you right now in this very moment regardless of what the past has looked like regardless if your if your marriage is on the rocks, if the addiction is taking hold of you, if, if, if the shame and the guilt of the past and the decisions or if the circumstances are just swirling around you, you're made in the image of God and God holds you and wants you to know that he loves you and his mercy is available to you, his grace is available to you. And I pray that we would just respond accordingly, but hold that message as we leave today. I've got one announcement that I want you to know about. And it's about an event that we have coming up, a church-wide event that's gonna be here at the Tyrone campus on Friday, October 21st. It is our Fall Fest. We did it last year. It was a great time. You're gonna wanna mark your calendars for Friday, October 21st, 5.30 to 8.30 here. We're gonna have over a dozen food trucks or local food vendors. We're gonna have bounce houses, five or six bounce houses for the kids games and candy, and then we're going to have live music. So this is a great opportunity to come and to be in community, but also to invite some people to join us and to simply just hang out. So we look forward to that event. Hope you will join us for that and know that we have some groups and classes. We have lots going on that we want to encourage you and invite you to participate. And you can ask us about those outside after this service, but everything we do from the the fan days to the fall fest, to the groups and classes and worship, it all goes towards our mission of helping people, all people get closer to God. And we cannot do that. We can't accomplish this mission or work towards that mission without you. So we want to first invite you to join us and where God is leading, invite you to participate, but also ask that you would contribute. And so if you feel led today to contribute, to make a donation, a gift or a tithe, uh, thank you. Again, we can't do it without you. There are ways to give online and there are ways to give here on the campus. There's some bins in the back of the wall here in the auditorium and a giving point station in our atrium. 
But friends, thank you for being here. And if it was your first time, join us again. We do this each week and we'd love to have you back. We have a fun environment planned right now after this service. We have a tailgate experience. There are gonna be hamburgers and hot dogs that are all ready to be served. There's the inflatable, get the competitive spirit in you. There's some cornhole, but come hang out. We have a visitor's tent out in the, the patio and encourage you to stop by. If you're a guest, we have a gift for you as a way of just saying thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. And there's a little bit of information in there about who we are as a church church and ways to get involved. So y'all ready to party? Let's go have some fun. Thanks so much for being here today. Have a great Sunday. Let's go have fun at the tailgate. We'll see you next week.